Greetings, intrepid mammologists. Professor Jared here again, and I welcome you to lecture 2.2 entitled Order Monotremata and Infraclass Metatheria. So this is going to align with chapter 10 in your textbook entitled Orders, Monotremata, and the Marsupials. So from here on out, every module will contain two lectures that are going to focus on specific mammalian orders that exemplify a broader concept. So we've just finished uh, discussing mammalian reproduction, so it makes sense to now hone in on the morphology, the taxonomy, the ecology, and the conservation of the monotremes, like the duck-billed platypus and the spiny echidnas, and the marsupials like the tiger quoll here, the wombat, and the tree kangaroos. So let's dive in. The monotremes, subclass Prototheria, are really pretty radically different than their marsupial and placental cousins in that they've retained a whole slew of primitive traits from their synapsid ancestors, including the cloaca, which is actually their namesake, monotremata, means one opening. The cloaca is this single reproductive urinary and fecal tract opening, as you see on the bottom left here on this spiny echidna as well as monotremes hatching from small rubbery eggs like this tiny hatching echidna here on the bottom right. Unlike their placental cousins, monotremes have two uteri as opposed to just one large muscular uterus in the placentals. You can see those two uteri here. Another difference is the monotremes just have one large functional ovary. The second ovary is considerably smaller and non-functional. However, uh, similarly, uh, fertilization is going to occur in the fallopian tube and then over the next two weeks the shell is deposited around that fertilized egg which is ultimately deposited here in the urogenital sinus to be laid out of the cloaca. Monotreme eggs are tiny so a mere 16 millimeters in length, that's a little over a half inch. Eggs are incubated for about 10 to 11 days. The platypus is going to curl around her eggs. Prior to hatching, the young develops this sharp egg tooth, just like in birds and reptiles, and that's going to allow um, the newborn to tear open that leathery egg. As previously mentioned, monotremes retained a whole slew of primitive characteristics uh, from their common synapsid ancestor with the reptiles, including a pectoral girdle that has a coracoid here, a precoracoid, and an interclavicle. So it's a similar morphology to what we see in the theraspid reptiles. The eutherian mammal is here on the right. Here's a theraspid reptile, and you can see that pectoral oral girdle and that splayed stance which is also exhibited by the echidna here. You can really see that reptilian splayed stance. Monotremes are endothermic but their body temperature is only about 32 degrees centigrade which is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit so they're gonna have considerably lower metabolic rates than their eutherian cousins. This is unusual Female monotremes have 10x chromosomes and males have 5x and 5y chromosomes instead of the single pair of sex chromosomes that we see in eutherians. And then lastly, uh, the sperm of monotremes, as well as their testes, they look like those of reptiles. So the sperm is thin and thread-like. 
In short, monotremes are this mosaic of specialized mammalian features as well as numerous retained archaic characteristics that are comparable to reptiles. So some features that are unique to monotremes include their bird-like skulls with elongated rostrums. Both the platypuses and the echidnas lack teeth. They have high-domed craniums. Their cochlea, the semicircle circular canal in the inner ear, those are not coiled. That's unlike any other mammal. Uh, adults have a large horn-like medial spur on the ankle and it's venomous in the platypuses. And then finally, there's no corpus callosum. That's the bundle of nerve fibers that are going to integrate the left and right hemispheres of the brain. We will begin with the family Ornithorhynchidae. Ornith, of course, is Greek for bird, and rhine, nose, so the bird nose. The duck-billed platypus is monotypic, meaning it's a group that includes only a single taxon. Duck-billed platypuses are distributed in freshwater lakes at both low and high elevations along the eastern coast of the Australian continent as well as throughout Tasmania. So there's an interesting insert in your text about the platypus bill, but in short, the platypus bill is soft, pliable, and very sensitive. It's the main sensory organ for navigation and locating food. And it's highly structured and quite complex. The skin of the bill is this mosaic of both mechanical and electrical receptors located on both the dorsal as well as the ventral surfaces. So there's an estimated 40,000 cells in that bill that allow it to sense electromagnetic fields as the platypus swims and moves its head from side to side while foraging. They have this groove that extends from the bill and contains both the tiny eyes and ears. During dives, that groove is going to close and the platypus is going to rely solely on the sensitivity of this bill to locate its prey, like the earthworm. So the feet of the duck-billed platypus are pentadactyl. Pentel, of course, means five-toed. And then the forefoot is webbed. However, when they're on land, this webbing is going to fold back and allow the platypus to walk on land. And if that's not weird enough, the platypus is venomous. It has a large venom gland in its thigh, as well as a sharp, strong, half-inch spur on its hind limb. So it's hypothesized that this spur evolved for intrasexual competition or male-to-male -male combat, but apparently it's no fun to become envenomated by a platypus as it results in, and I quote, immediate and intractable pain and marked swelling. So platypuses are going to build burrows in the stream banks. The male burrows are relatively simple, but the female can actually burrow up to 90 feet into the stream bank, and then their burrows culminate in this nesting chamber where she's gonna lay those precious eggs and incubate them by curling her body around them. The young, after they hatch, they're gonna remain in that burrow for four to five months nursing. The family Tachyglossidae includes the short-beaked echidna as well as the western long-beaked echidna. And you'll probably never guess which is which. <laughs> the short-beak echidna here occurs in Australia, Tasmania, and southern uh, Papua New Guinea. 
Uh, it's the most widely distributed endemic mammal in Australia. The long-beaked echidnas are only found in those very ecologically rich highlands of Papua New Guinea. The echidnas have a beak that also contains electroreceptors, although not as many as in the platypus. However, they do have a seven inch long sticky tongue. So tachyglossidae actually means rapid tongue and it refers to their propensity to snarf up ants and termites and other insects. These are guard hairs that have been modified to form barbless spines. And then lastly, I was surprised to learn that echidnas can live up to 50 years, which is quite long for such a small animal. According to the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, platypus populations are declining because of habitat loss created by stream erosion, poor water quality, as well as introduced placental carnivores like the red fox. The short-beaked echidna, as pictured here, is doing just fine. Remember, these guys are distributed across uh, Australia, Tasmania, southern New Guinea. Um, however, the long-beaked echidna, as well as Sir David's long-beaked echidna, named for uh, my hero, David Attenborough, those long-beaked echidnas are both critically endangered. Marsupials. So they get their name from the female's abdominal pouch or the marsupium. Here you can see some baby Tasmanian devils that are suckling on mom's teats uh, within the marsupium. This is actually kind of a poor diagnostic feature because not all marsupials have a marsupium like the short-tailed opossum. And the echidnas, which are monotremes, do have a marsupium. So marsupials are best distinguished by small maternal energy investment in altricial or underdeveloped young. So interesting factoid for you to amaze your friends at parties this weekend. No marsupials have litters that weigh more than 1% of mother's body mass. So that said, maternal investment in lactation is much greater in the marsupials than in the placentals. So as Renfri noted, marsupials have in effect exchanged the umbilical cord for the teat. In comparison to their eutherian cousins, the metatherian marsupials have basal metabolic rates that are about 30% lower than comparably sized placentals. Also, uh, the marsupial brain is considerably smaller than that of the placental, again, accounting for body size. This is especially pronounced in large-bodied marsupials like the red kangaroo. Unlike the placentals, there are no uh, fully marine marsupials that are akin to the cetaceans, the dolphins, and the whales. There are no marsupials that have evolved true powered flight like the placental bats, although there are gliding marsupials. And then also there's no uh, fossorial herbivorous marsupials, meaning uh, burrowing marsupials uh, that are herbivorous. So all that said, there is an outstanding array of behavioral and morphological adaptations that characterize the seven orders of the marsupials. So think kickboxing kangaroos, uh, the koala bear, uh, which has evolved uh, a specialized diet feeding on only eucalyptus, uh, the incredible bite force of the Tasmanian devil, and least we not forget the cube feces of the wombat. 
So for the remainder of the lecture, we're going to quickly survey each of those seven orders and many of the families. Let's begin with the order Didelpha morphia, which includes the single extant family Didelphidae. So these are the New World or American opossums. There are 18 genera, remember that's the plural for genus, uh, there are 18 genera and 111 species in the family uh, Didelphidae. Let's see, uh, the Didelphids are characterized by their tails. Most have this long, sparsely haired prehensile tail. Uh, a prehensile tail is going to allow the animal to uh, hold on to and manipulate objects, almost like an additional uh, um, arm. It's going to allow your arboreal opossums to hang from their tails to grasp tree branches uh, while they forage. And then they're also characterized by an opposable thumb, which again uh, accommodates uh, many of their semi-arboreal or arboreal habitats. The arboreal bushy-tailed opossum is found in humid tropical rainforests in Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil. There are three species of woolly opossums that are forest inhabitants of southern Mexico, Central America, and North Central South America. And then we have the uh, diminutive 10 to 15 gram Kalinowski's mouse opossum, which is a denizen of lowland forests in Amazonia. Several didelphids, like this yellow-sided opossum here on the left, show simulparity. Simulparity is a life history strategy in which all or most of the males die after mating, and then the females die after weaning their young. The most specialized uh, didelphid is the yapok, or the water opossum. So this is the only marsupial that's adapted for an aquatic habitat and a diet of small vertebrates. So the hind feet of the yapok are webbed, and then the female's marsupium is going to seal um, and become impenetrable to the water, keeping her young safe while she dives. Which leads us to the Virginia opossum, Didelphus virginiana, and this week's discussion prompt. Many mammals, such as the Virginia opossum, are known to produce more young then can be supported by the number of the mother's mammae, her teats. This attribute seems maladaptive. Explain this apparent waste of energy. To help comment intelligibly on this post, please listen to the Stated Clearly video I've embedded in Canvas that's entitled Survival of the Fittest. What does it really mean? The order Posse tuberculata contains just a single family, the Canolestidae, which is comprised of three genera and seven species of shrew or rat opossums. Of course, shrews and rats are placentals. The five species of Canolestes occur in dense vegetation, in cold, wet, high elevation forests and meadows of northwestern South America. The Canolestids are primarily nocturnal, insectivorous or omnivorous, and terrestrial. The single family in this order, the Microbiotheria, contains only one extant species, and that is the Monito del Monte, the little monkey of the mountains. The Monito del Monte is nocturnal, it's clearly arboreal, it inhabits temperate rainforests in south-central Chile and adjacent Argentina. 
So prior to hibernation, this species accumulates fat at the base of its prehensile tail. This is called an incrassated tail, one that has evolved to store energy as fat reserves. It can store enough fat in just one week uh, to double its body mass. Interestingly, this species also exhibits short periods of daily torpor depending upon ambient environmental conditions. So torpor is when an organism is capable of lowering its metabolic rate, lowering its body temperature. In this instance, this species is capable of lowering its metabolic rate by a whopping 92%. Uh, as a frugivore, or a fruit-eating mammal, the Monito del Monte plays a crucial ecosystem role in dispersing native seeds in its feces. And then finally, recall from the video how South America made the marsupials in lecture 1.4 that the Monito del Monte is the sole living representative from this order, Microbiotheria, which likely represents the ancestral lineage of all of the Australian marsupials. So this is a really important important relic species. And with that, let's now jump over to the continent of Australia. We'll begin with the order Dazi Euromorphia, which includes three families of carnivorous and insectivorous marsupials, uh, including the namesake family, the Dazi Uridae, the Myrmecobidae, and the Thylacinidae. Most of the extant species are in this Dazi Uridae family. And then with the extinction of the thylacine, the Dazi Urid, the Tasmanian devil, is now the largest living carnivorous marsupial. And that brings us to the heart-wrenching tale of the thylacine. The thylacine was often called the Tasmanian tiger, presumably because of those dorsal stripes or the Tasmanian wolf. But as you budding mammologists know, the thylacine was neither tiger nor wolf. Those are placentals. It was a large carnivorous marsupial in the order Dazi Euromorphia. Thylacine fossils have been recovered from the Australian mainland, Papua New Guinea, as well as Tasmania, of course. And further, Aboriginal rock art confirms that the thylacine was in Australia when the first inhabitants, the first peoples, colonized Australia. By the time the Europeans arrive, the thylacine's range has been greatly reduced. It's restricted only to the island of Tasmania. It's likely that competition with the dingoes that were introduced by those original uh, Aboriginal people was probably a significant factor in outcompeting and reducing the thylacine's range. And the species may have survived in uh, to modern times in Tasmania because dingoes were not introduced there. European settlers arrived in Tasmania at the beginning of the 19th century. And upon doing so, they set out to tame the wilderness and reshape the Tasmanian landscape in the image of their homelands. The thylacine was perceived as a wolf amongst their sheep, and it acquired this notorious reputation as a killer of livestock, despite the fact that the settlers' dogs were probably far more destructive. But there was no room for predators in the pastoral paradise envisioned by these settlers, and therefore a bounty was set to ensure thylacine extermination. 
the peak of the killing occurred in 1900. Indiscriminate killing coupled with population fragmentation and habitat loss caused the thylacine population to decline rapidly. Disease may also have contributed to the demise of this decimated, fragmented population. A few naturalists recognized this precipitous decline of this really amazing species, but ultimately the concerns of the ranchers took precedence. The last shooting of a wild thylacine uh, was documented in 1930, and the last captive individual shown here died in the Hobart Zoo in 1936. Ironically, the same year that the species was granted legal protection, so a little bit too late. The thylacine's reputation as a sheep killer was likely significantly overstated. The thylacine only weighed an estimated 35 to 40 pounds, and its teeth and limbs suggest that its prey was most likely to have been relatively small compared to its body size. It likely fed on bandicoots and possums. It probably hunted its prey in a pounce and pursuit manner in fairly open habitats, and it killed with a crushing, penetrating bite. That's an impressive maw right there. Um, the remains of small to medium-sized herbivores, all weighing less than 5 kilograms, approximately 11 pounds, have been found in cave deposits along with thylacine remains. Hunters reported that the thylacine stomach contents did include kangaroo, but also echidna remains. So since the uh, death of the last individual in the Hobart Zoo in 1936, there have been several exhaustive searches over the decades, most recently in 2017. Uh, during which time 580 camera traps were deployed in North Queensland by James Cook University after two people, an experienced outdoorsman and a former park ranger, reported having seen a thylacine there in the 1980s, but uh, according to reports, they were too embarrassed uh, to tell anyone at that time. However, according to the Department of Primary Industries, Parks, Water, and Environment, that's a mouthful, there have been eight unconfirmed thylacine sighting reports between 2016 and 2019, with the latest unconfirmed visual sighting occurring on the 25th of February, 2018. But as of this recording, there has yet to be a confirmed sighting of the thylacine. Sigh. The family Myrmacobidae is monotypic and includes only the numbat. The numbat is highly specialized for a diet of exclusively ants and termites. So this is a niche known as Myrmecophagy. This numbat, uh, the species is now restricted to isolated populations in arid scrub woodlands in southwestern Australia, as introduced predatory foxes and feral cats have greatly reduced numbat populations to likely less than a thousand individuals. The numbat is listed as endangered by the IUCN, that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The family Daziuridae is a large, diverse family, including 17 genera and 76 species. The Daziurids are the most structurally and functionally generalized of the Australian marsupials. Daziurids range in size from the smallest marsupials, the marsupial mice, like you see here, up to the largest marsupial, largest carnivore, the Tasmanian devil. Daziurids occur throughout Australia and New Guinea, where they occupy all terrestrial and semi-arboreal habitats, from deserts to high-elevation rainforests. They're primarily nocturnal or crepuscular, meaning active.
active at dawn or dusk, and they're solitary. On the top left is the Tasmanian devil. Uh, devils are scavengers that have an ecological niche comparable to the North American wolverine. You can see it's got this really uh, large maw and uh, a very strong jaw. I have some good news about devils that I'm going to return to on the next slide. There are six species of quolls, uh, like this tiger or spotted quoll. These guys weigh up to 15 pounds, and they're going to eat small mammals, small birds, lizards, and insects. All six of the quoll species have drastically declined in numbers since Australia was colonized by Europeans, with one species, the eastern quoll, uh, becoming extinct on the Australian mainland and hanging on now only on the island of Tasmania. Major threats to quoll survival include the toxic cane toad, introduced predators, of course, such as feral cats and foxes, urban development, and even poison baiting. The Kangaroo Island Dunart is also in trouble. It's listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. Population was believed to be around 500 individuals before the horrific 2019-2020 Australian bushfires. So following those fires, it's believed that only about 50 of these kangaroo island dunarts are left in existence. And um, we're going to return to those devastating fires uh, later in the presentation when we discuss koala bears. This is the brush-tailed Mulgara. It's kind of cool. Uh, these guys uh, have incrassated tails, uh, meaning they can store fat in those tails. So right now, uh, do me a solid, put me on pause and check out Darwin and the Devil's Plight. It's about facial tumor disease. That's an infectious cancer that has just decimated uh, Tasmanian devil populations. However, it now appears that some individuals that are surviving have uh, resistance uh, to tumor facial disease. Their tumors are healing. Um, so conservation success stories can be few and far between. So take one minute and 18 seconds and uh, please check out this video embedded in Canvas. The order Paramelimorphia contains the Australian Easter Bunny, the Greater Bilby, or the Rabbit-Eared Bandicoot as pictured here. The omnivorous bandicoots occur across the Austral Asia biogeographic province from arid deserts all the way up to high elevation rainforests. The family Paramelidae includes six genera and 20 species of extant bandicoots ranging in size from the mouse bandicoot with a maximum length of just seven inches to the giant bandicoot, which has a body mass of 11 pounds. This striking species is the eastern barred bandicoot. There are two recognized species of bilbies, the threatened greater bilby living in arid habitats in northwestern Australia, and the lesser bilby, which probably became extinct in the 1960s. And these are two very strange species. The order Nodorictamorphia encompasses just a single family, the Nodorictidae, which includes the southern marsupial mole and northern marsupial mole. So these are the only completely fossorial or burrowing marsupials. They spend the majority of their lives underground. You can notice the remnants here of an eye, a vestigial eye. These no longer function. 
These uh, marsupial moles are widely distributed over much of northwestern and central Australia, occurring in shrub desert areas and sandy bottomed soils. Insectivorous, their diet consists primarily of ants, termites, beetle larvae, and apparently the occasional centipede. All right, we've made it to the last order. Order Diprotodontia includes 11 extant families comprised of species like the koala bear, the wombat, the <clears throat> ring-tailed possums, the kangaroos, my favorite, the cuscusses. This is the feather tail glider, and then the pygmy possums here on the bottom right. So given that this order has 155 recognized species, adaptive radiation has been extensive. Some species feed on insects, others nectar, still others leaves, fruit, others still are omnivores. Many species are terrestrial, although some are obviously arboreal. My son's favorite animal, the koala bear, has a highly specialized diet. So on the menu, leaves, stems, flowers, and even bark all from the eucalyptus tree. So koalas inhabit eastern and southeastern Australian eucalyptus woodlands. As you would imagine, eucalyptus is very poor quality forage, not a lot of calories, but koalas have reduced energy requirements they move very slowly and they remain inactive for up to 20 hours a day. Truly living the dream, right? Uh, their alimentary tract has the largest cecum, that's the intestinal pouch at the junction of the small and the large intestines. Has the, the koalas have the largest cecum relative to body size of any other mammal. Unfortunately, the koala has now been designated as endangered. Populations of koalas have been ravaged by chlamydia, which can cause blindness and infertility in koalas. And then to add insult to injury, the bushfires in the Australian summer 2019-2020. So gang, we are living in the age of rapid climate change. Fair warning, this video is kind of harsh uh, to watch, but I think it's important that we don't look away. So please take three minutes and check out the embedded video in Canvas entitled Koalas Need Help Surviving Australia's Fires, uh, produced by The Dodo. The family Vombatidae includes the two genera and three species of wombats. Wombats have short limbs, they're plantigrade, meaning they walk on the soles of their feet like humans and bears, and they're powerful burrowers. Uh, these guys are really big, so adult body mass is about 30 kilograms, so that's 66 pounds. That's actually heavier than the thylacine. This is a common wombat, the bear-nosed wombat. It's found in forested areas of southeastern Australia and Tasmania. The southern hairy-nosed wombat inhabits semi-arid regions of southern Australia. And then finally, there's the critically endangered northern hairy-nosed wombat. And it's now restricted to just a 500-hectare portion of Epping Forest National Park in central Queensland. And here's a pic of one of those hairy-nosed wombats sitting atop of his burrow. Wombats are the only marsupial to have open-rooted, continuously growing dentition, which makes sense because they're herbivorous. They have a broad skull, as you can see here, with robust jaw muscles and cheek teeth, premolars and molars that are well adapted for abrasive grasses and forbs.
On hot, dry days, wombats are going to remain in deep, extensive, interconnected burrow systems that protect them from predators and fires and harsh ambient conditions. The trade-off, however, is, is that the construction of these burrow systems is energetically expensive and wombats are living on grass, so their me metabolic rate is extremely low, even for a marsupial. And finally, I address that question that has undoubtedly been burning in your mind since the beginning of this lecture. How do wombats poop cubes. The only animal in nature to mark its territory with tidy little piles of fecal cubes. So this one's really great footage and it's only three minutes. Please check it out, embedded in canvas. As their name implies, the pygmy possums are the most diminutive possums. They're quite small. The smallest species has a mean adult body mass of just seven grams. So that's the equivalent of like seven regular sized paper clips. In addition to invertebrates, fruits, and seeds, the pygmy possums are also going to consume nectar and pollen. Thus, they have these long, extendable brush tongues with papillae for lapping up these floral delicacies. There are four species of brush tail possums, like the common brush tail possum seen here on the bottom left. And then there are 25 species of cuscusses, like this uh, flamboyant spotted cuscus here who lives in the bountiful tropical rainforests of Papua New Guinea. Like many of the American uh, opossums, these uh, brush tail possums and cuscuses are nocturnal. They have long prehensile grasping tails and they are arboreal. The aptly named family Acrobatidae includes the feather tail glider, the world's smallest gliding mammal. So the feather tail glider possesses a furred patagium. That's a gliding membrane that extends between the elbows and the knees. There are six genera and 20 species of ringtail possums, including the species pictured here, the western ringtailed possum. This species is critically endangered due to the drying climate, urban development, altered fire regimes, and predation by invasive feral foxes and cats. The Petauridae includes four species of possum-like triox, the striped possum, the leadbetter's possum, and then six species of wrist-winged gliders, like this adorable sugar glider. These arboreal gliders are named for the patagium that extends from the wrist to the ankle, similar to the feather tail glider. The marsupial gliders are highly convergent. They have very similar morphology to the North American gliding squirrels, like Glaucomys volans, but of course they're not closely related to the flying squirrels. The tiny honey possum is the only non-flying mammal that feeds exclusively on nectar and pollen. It's adapted to this lifestyle with a, a long pointed rostrum, a tubular mouth, and an extendable brush-tipped tongue. The musky rat kangaroo, and you gotta love those common names, is monotypic, meaning it's the sole member in its family. So this implies that it's distinct morphologically, genetically, from other species in the order Diprotodontia. 
There are four genera and 12 extant species in the family Podoruidae, including the long-nosed Podoru, uh, pictured here. Interestingly, these omnivores have a penchant for fungus. And lastly, that family that you've all likely been waiting for, that family that's truly emblematic of Australian wildlife, the macro podidae. Macro means large, pod is foot, the large footed family of wallabies and kangaroos. There are 13 genera and 67 extant species in this family, ranging in size from the two pound hair wallaby here on the left to the 175 pound red kangaroos. All living macropodids are herbivores and they occupy practically all terrestrial habitats from deserts to rainforests throughout Austral Asia. And let's not forget about the semi-arboreal tree kangaroos on the bottom right. Ecologically and morphologically, the macropodids have evolutionarily converged into that large herbivorous niche occupied by the placental artiodactyls, the deer, the sheep, the goats in other bioregions around the world. So for example, kangaroos have large divided stomachs that are home to a whole slew of microbes that are capable of breaking down cellulose. So similar to placental cows that chew their cud, red kangaroos will regurgitate their food for additional mastication before re-swallowing. Obviously, the macropodids have strong, well-developed hind limbs and large hind feet but they also have this long, broad tail that actually serves a variety of functions. The tail can be a tripod while the kangaroos are reaching up and foraging. It can serve as a fifth limb uh, in what's called pentapedal locomotion, two, four, five limbs. And then lastly, that tail serves as a counterbalance during rapid bipedal hopping at speeds up to 30 plus miles per hour. Oh, and let us not forget how those strong, well-developed hind limbs are used in male-to-male -male combat. So for your final video, please, please check out David Attenborough and this amazing footage of red kangaroo kickboxing. So some of these males are truly intimidating. All right, in closing, I want to point out table 10.1 in your textbook. This is the first part of the table and it summarizes all of the orders and the families that I covered in this lecture today. So fair warning, on your exam this week, you'll be asked to match a handful of common names to their families and or orders. So, i.e. the kangaroos and wallabies are in the family Macropodidae in the order Diprotodontia. So I'm asking you, please spend a bit of time and study the taxonomy presented in this lecture. And as always, here are the references that are also cited uh, in the text and that I used in this lecture. Awesome. I really hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.